I'm Norman Swan. Welcome to this program on Parkinson's disease. It's a debilitating and challenging condition for both the person with Parkinson's and their families and carers. It's also commoner in rural settings. With no cure, treatment aims to minimise the impact of the symptoms on the person's quality of life. And we're going to look at the latest advances in diagnosis, treatment and management of Parkinson's. Tonight it's a live simulcast, webcast and television broadcast viewable at RHEF satellite television receiving sites nationally and on NITV. And we've got viewers right across Australia in places such as Mitchell in Queensland, Findlay Hospital in Mildura in New South Wales, Canberra, Mount Gambia, Derby, Derby I should say Derby, I'm sure my British origins, Derby in WA and many other places. Now we're also welcoming viewers who are historically watching this program on the new Rural Health Channel. This is a dedicated free-to-air health station and it's on channel 600 on the VAST platform. We well, you know all about that if you're watching it, but if you're not watching it, it's important to know. And it began broadcasting on the 21st of May and will be broadcast 24 hours a week with sessions on weekday afternoons and evenings and a late afternoon session after the footy on Sundays. The Rural Health Channel will have professionally accredited programs from the Rural Health Education Foundation, along with health education and information programs from other organisations. Anyone with a vast satellite dish and set-top set box will be able to view the channel. More information can be found on the Foundation's website, rhaf.com.au slash rhc. Now back to tonight's programme. As with all our live programmes, you can ask questions of the panel by email, phone or fax. The details are on screen now. You can send your emails to questions at rhef.com.au or phone us at 1-800-817-268 and we'll put you to air if you feel like it. We can also fax your questions to 1-800-633-410. Now if you're watching the webcast on your computer, to ask a question or make a comment, type your question into the live talk box and click submit. Now we get a lot of empty emails from you and I suspect you're not clicking submit. So you write your question in the live talk box and then press submit, otherwise we get something odd from you. We'll be taking questions throughout the panel discussion so please send them in as they arise. And we'll also be asking you questions throughout the programme and look forward to your answers and we'll poll you and present them back. So now let's meet our panel. Geraldine Duncan has been in general practice for 30 years in Wagga. Her interest is in, in Parkinson's disease grew out of a medical student research project. The study looked at the needs of people with Parkinson's in a regional area with respect to both medical and allied health involvement. Welcome Geraldine. Hello Norman. Moira Lewis was diagnosed with Parkinson's in 2006. Welcome Moira. Thank you Norman. Moira is a registered nurse and midwife and has qualifications in diabetes and gerontology. Moira lives in country Victoria and she's an ambassador for Parkinson's Victoria. Simon Lewis is a consultant neurologist at Royal Prince Alfred Hospital in Sydney and also is associate professor in cognitive neuroscience at the University of Sydney. Welcome Simon. Thanks for having me. Simon's director of the Parkinson's Disease Research Clinic at the Brain and Mind Research Institute at the University of Sydney and heads the New South Wales Movement Disorders Brain Donor Program. You're not getting anything from us tonight, Simon. It's an investment program. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll, we will be sucking each other's brains, but in a very metaphoric sense. Meg Morris is a research professor in the School of Physiotherapy at the University of Melbourne. Welcome, Meg. Thank you. Meg completed her PhD in 1996 investigating the physiotherapy management of gait disorders in Parkinson's disease. And Marilia Pereira is Australia's first neurological nurse educator with more than 14 years experience in neurology. Welcome Marilia. Thank you Norman. Marilia is based at the Nara Community Health Centre in New South Wales and provides a domiciliary service to clients and their carers living with Parkinson's and other neuro neurodegenerative disorders in the Shoalhaven area. Are you a nurse practitioner officially? No, I'm a nurse consultant. How many are there like you around the country? There are 33 nurses around the country and only seven of us are based in community. So right. the rest are based in hospitals. And many nurse practitioners in, in Parkinson's and neurology? Two. One in Queensland and I think the other one's in Victoria. Is that that's uh, Well, right? uh, yeah. the first thing yeah. I was going to try and yeah. raise politically, if I may, is yeah. as people hear from my accent, I'm a ring-in. Uh, I'm not retarded. It, this is my accent. Um, but in the UK, they've had... Parkinson's nurses in the community for over 20 years. There are over 250 of them. They've got their own college. And in Australia, we seem to have been in the control arm of that study um, and lacking uh, this sort of service until recently, and we, we're trying to push this agenda. 
How important have nurses been to you, Moira? They were my bloodline, or <laughs> yes, they were my saving grace in the beginning. Um, soon after my diagnosis, I was put in touch with one. Went and saw her, oh, just made everything quite normal for me. But better still, it was also for my husband, the knowledge that he gained out of that, yeah. and to learn to live with Parkinson's too. How, how did it all begin? Um, okay, it was April Fool's Day, 2006, I was diagnosed. But of course, prior to that, I'd noticed the stiff hip, the um, stiff shoulder. Um, I then did... Um, stiff or painful? Well, it was painful, but it was stiff like when I bent it up and down. But I mean, I'd been nursing for many years. I mean, I put it down to a good old nurse's sore hip and the same with the shoulder. So like any of us, you just ignored it? Yeah, yeah. Then one night at work, I did notice. I can still remember it sitting at the phone and my little thumb giving a bit of a tremor. Hmm. And then slowly along the way, they're so subtle, these changes coming, that you don't really doesn't hit you like a whole like Oh, a no, it's not like an acute onset. You know, it's just gradual. Everything comes gradual. And also, too, it won't always be present at the, at the same time. They're not all present on the one day, these symptoms. It just seems to come and go a lot. Um, freak, um, uh, urgency of urine, passing urine. But I put that down to I'd given birth to children. Just women's problems. <laughs> women's problems, totally. Yeah. And it was probably just towards the end that a lot of things just fell into sequence and they were there a little bit more. And a little so what bit made more you thin. go and...? Um, well, actually, it was one night at work and it was um, my GP said to me, Moira, are you dragging your right leg? Mm, yes. Um, well, what's this all about? And I stammered out, what do you know about a tremor? Oh, come around here and see me now. Oh, right, yeah. So that I did. And you'd also noticed something with your face as well, hadn't you? Yeah, I had. Um, one day I was getting ready for work and I was well, putting on my red lipstick, as I always did. And I'm going, smile, Moira, smile. And I, it just wasn't coming. But I didn't think about it. Look, I knew very little about Parkinson's, so I wasn't associating it. Until I started to think about it myself and I went, uh-uh, and started grabbing for the internet and looking up a few sites and I went, mm, a lot of this is all falling into place. And if it's, it is a rude question, but how old were you when you...? Oh, 57. What's been your journey since? Well, since then, I went on and I worked for two and a half years after that in nursing, but that became more difficult. Um, I was very aware of my professional integrity and I wasn't going to allow Parkinson's to interfere with my career. I um, made the choice to leave work. It was a very sad choice. I um, didn't enjoy it at all. Um, but um, since then, I decided, well, I've got to turn my life around. I've got to look for something now. And um, I've been doing work for Parkinson's Victoria in an ambassadorial capacity. And what sort of treatments have you been on? When did that start? When uh, the treatment started immediately because I had functional neurologist said, uh, well, and I knew it, I had some functional disability. So I started um, a, dop a dopamine agonist immediately. Um, and that was fabulous for about eight months. So this is not L-Dopa, this is no, it was one of the other ones? one of the others. And um, I had a wonderful time on that. I was feeling quite very good, actually. Um, and we'd been gradually increased titrating the dose up. And then all of a sudden I started getting some side effects to it. And um, they, were, they were the most debilitating thing in my life. What side I, effects did you get? I had some um, hallucinations panic attacks which were just look indescribable I, I just felt like I was just dying I also had some tactile um, feelings like creeping through my head it was just so debilitating all my husband could do was just sit and hold me when any of these attacks happened um, and the good one was hypersexuality <laughs> and I mean 
Ray thought so this is where great. can we get some, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, and as I said to my friends, I could go on the black market, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> so you into white slavery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but that was the most interesting time. And of course, we took that dose down and um, things were much better and I started on cinnamon. Mm. Right. And now? And now, um, what treatment? Yes, I'm on um, Cinemat, Comtan and um, Cifrol. And how are you going? I reckon I'm travelling all right. I have good days, have bad days, but who doesn't? And do you have off periods? Where you... I do. I have off periods where I have wearing off. And then I For have... people who don't know about Parkinson's watching, describe an off period. An off period is where my medication goes off and you would find, for me, that I probably would develop the mask that they talk about, which is just a bland expression of the face where we look like we're totally disinterested in anything going on around us. Um, I would become very slow in movement, like bending down to pick up something. Well, that's an interesting exercise as you watch me going down. I look like probably about a hundred year old trying to get down to pick it up. Um, I'd be very slow in movement as I'm walking down the hallway at home. I'd probably bang into the wall. As I went through a doorway, I'd bang into a door. You don't seize up completely? I'm not seizing up completely. Um, most interesting thing is rolling over in bed. If I'm really down on my medication, well, yes, that's an interesting exercise. I have to sit up in bed to roll over. I'm going to ask you, uh, first of all, poll questions for this program. Remember, you can answer more than one question, and this is really for the people you can ask, them, you can answer it for yourself if you're watching it uh, on television, but really for people who are watching the webcast. Which of these symptoms would cause you to consider a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease? Slowness of movement, frozen shoulder, balance disturbance, disturbed sleep, depression, or ataxia? And don't forget to click on the poll tab, not the question tab, uh, for this answer. So you've got 30 seconds to answer that question. And before we come to symptoms, just so that they don't cheat on this when they're answering the poll question, Simon, how common are those side effects from the dopamine agonists? Uh, the, the, they're bracketed as impulse control disorders. So hypersexuality is one of those. Pathological gambling, so people spending money they don't have. And we're talking about hundreds. So it's almost like hypomania. Absolutely. And it's almost, you know, and, and unfortunately people often realise that they're doing these things. So excessive shopping is another mm -hmm. online. And it's been said in the largest trial that's been published, about 14% of patients will actually get some form of impulse control disorder when they take a dopamine agonist. It does happen with the levodopa compounds as well, but less frequently. So, really, how common are those symptoms that Moira talked about as early presentation for part? Is that typical? Yep, very typical. Um, probably most of my clients will have at least one or two of the symptoms Moira described, especially that frozen shoulder. Um, commonly they're investigated by an orthopaedic surgeon prior to being diagnosed with Parkinson's because of this fro frozen shoulder. So, yeah. And I think the other common one you see is the shuffling walking pattern, mm. the, the very short steps Mm. Slow walking pattern, often reduced arm swing on it's one the, side. It's the, it's the husband or wife noticing the arm doesn't swing. Yes. So they say, what's wrong with you for crying out? What's wrong? Mm. And you know, yeah. act normal, act normal, and then it goes off again, and they, they don't swing. So arm. right, act normal. That is so. <laughs> right. And you, you did cooking classes. We've got a picture of you at cooking classes, and you had an issue with movement here. Yeah, I did. Um, I went to Paris and did a cooking class in macaroons, and my two daughters came with me, and. Um, when um, we had to, to pipe these macaroons, it just nothing went from the brain to the hands for me. It just didn't happen. And I had little squiggly lines going across the page. And I was so embarrassed, I had my head tucked down. And suddenly my daughters realised that I was in big trouble. And just, they just started. They said, Mum, listen. One, two, three, stop, lift. And once they got me into a sequence and cueing and... This is getting to a deliberate action. A deliberate action. I was right. Geraldine, it must be hard for general practitioners because not everybody presents the same way and you don't see that many people with Parkinson's disease in your career. Exactly. And, and the, the symptom complex is so subtle, not necessarily all occurring at the same That's time. Right. And so what you need to do is have it in your head maybe and put it together. And of course, so many other patients come in with similar symptoms 
due to other reasons mm. um, that it's not there at the forefront of your mind. So I guess as GPs we've just got to think, add Parkinson's to the list of what our DDs might be um, for the frozen shoulder mm. or, or, or whatever that's coming in. Let's get your answers to our poll question. So the question is, well, which of these symptoms would you consider to be diagnostic of Parkinson's disease? And uh, slowness of movement, you scored highly on that. Not many of you scored on frozen shoulder, when in fact that is an issue. Balance disturbance, you um, said yes. Sleep disturbance, yes, you said. Depression and ataxia, you said, a lot of you said yes too. Um, Simon? Looking at that, and um, obviously the graphic uh, there depicts it quite well, people have realised that balance is a big problem with Parkinson's disease, but it's one of those things that we see in more advanced disease. So it, an initial presentation, problems which we might think of as, you know, falling over or an inability to coordinate the hands is not something that we would, you know, characteristically label uh, as, as early Parkinson's, something later in the disease, I'd later say. Later on, yes. You know, when people are starting falling over or if they develop freezing of gait, for example. Yes. I mean, we we'll often see those balance disturbances, and, you know, it used to be a triad when, when we were at medical school and now it's, you know, tetrad of the cardinal signs of Parkinson's and postural instability has been added to the tremor, the slowness and stiffness. But our audience, at least on the web, don't pick frozen shoulder as being one of the things. And if I only had a dollar for every patient that had been referred to me as, you know, query frozen shoulder or I trapped a nerve doctor, and it's one of the uh, features, I mean, this is a disease that happens in, happens in uh, stages and, you know, subtle as we've heard. And so it's good, I, I was quite pleased to see that people were picking up depression, uh, for example, and of course there are very clear premotor symptoms and people here picked up on sleep disturbance as well. So things like insomnia, excessive daytime somnolence and the very fascinating dream enactment behaviour we see with rapid eye movement sleep behaviour disorder or RBD. So, so just give me the clinical definition. Of Parkinson's mm -hmm. disease is a common neurodegenerative disease which is really characterised by a loss of cells in the brain and the cells that take the hardest hit, but not by any means the only hit, are the dopamine producing cells of the brain. And dopamine is a vital chemical transmitter that's involved with movement, with mood and with thinking. And we heard a lot of those features, um, not only from the disease itself, but also when we start to, if you like, try and change the disease with medication. But Meg, that's one of the myths about this, that people think of it just as a movement disorder, where it's much more pervasive. It does. I mean, movement disorders are very <coughs> classic features of, of Parkinson's. So typically the movements become very slow and scaled down in size. So the handwriting is perfectly formed, but it's miniature. And the facial expression can become you know, absent because the muscles aren't working properly. But alongside that you have cognitive impairment, sometimes later on, but also autonomic disturbance too in some people. Such well, as? Uh, excessive sweating. Yeah, uh, postural hypotension dizziness. for sure. So people yeah. dropping their blood pressure in advanced disease. But it's very important what, what Meg just said, you know, cognitive impairment late. Well, actually, at time of diagnosis, we know that at least half of patients have some degree of impairment in their cognition. And so, you know, you think you're going crazy. Mm. And, you know, in actual fact, it's just part of the disease. And similarly, right. depression and yeah. all of these other anxiety, panic attacks. I never had panic attacks, Doc. Why do I have panic attacks oh, now? Yes. And it's, it's very common to hear that story mm. because not only the dopamine, but serotonergic and noradrenergic systems. And the average age of diagnosis? Currently going down, it's now at about 65 or below. Why um, is it going down? I think because we're getting cluier. Um, so it's, it's a diagnostic phenomenon. We're, we're getting a bit better. I think the other thing that it's worth bearing in mind is that 5% of all cases are under the age of 40, which is not an mm. insignificant number when you consider the number of cases we have in the country. So it, it's a pretty, uh, it's a disease that doesn't respect too many boundaries. And relentless or not? Relentless. I mean, it is a disease that at the moment we uh, are unable to stop. So um, early intervention doesn't make any good? I think it's a great idea to get early intervention, but the approaches we need to focus on are really exercising the body and the mind. We'll come back to that in a moment. Difference between ethnic groups? No, uh, no real ethnic group differences. We, uh, so why is, it, why is it more common in the country? Well, people have suggested, obviously, uh, an exposure to pesticides. And big studies that have been done have shown that if you're exposed to significant doses of pesticides in your working career, um, that you're more likely to develop Parkinson's. But we're talking about maybe tripling the risk. And if that's three in a thousand, well, actually, that's not much greater than one in a thousand. So people have talked about, I mean, we know that there are neurotoxins, There's, there was that, that, that epi, you know, mini epidemic in yes. California yep. with yep. The, in the drug lab, yep. MDMA. 
What about uh, peppermint? People say peppermint is a neurotoxin. Look, I, I, I get an email every week about what the neurotoxin was, and uh, we discussed this off air, but uh, coming to Australia, I came across a lot of veterans who told me about Agent Orange. Uh, I'd never heard of Agent Orange, but it was something that a lot of people who've been exposed in the war believe that was the agent. And we haven't really got compelling evidence to, to, to prove that that is the, the true origin of the disease. Head injury in Alzheimer's is a risk factor. Is it in, in Parkinson's? It is. So having a head injury that's sufficient to knock you out or fracture your skull does seem to increase the risk. But again, um, we've got an enormous amount of people who have Parkinson's disease who've never had a head injury. So it's not the answer. As and smoking is protective? Smoking is protective. Um, it's not a good reason to go out and start smoking. Um, and Has again, anybody tried nicotine to treat Parkinson's? I, I'm unaware of any successful trials that have shown nicotine as being an agent that we can honestly uh, endorse. Any other protective factors? Uh, we know that caffeine um, seems to reduce your risk of developing Parkinson's disease. Again, um, there are lots of people out there who drink caffeine and seem Still to develop think, Parkinson's yeah. disease. So I don't think, think we should all just start going out and... And what about genetics, hereditary? Yeah, genetics is interesting. There are a number of genes, sort of about 13 genes that have been described that give a very different sort of Parkinson's disease, much younger onset, much more strong family history, um, and they account for a very small percentage of the cases. But when you look at a family history in patients who have Parkinson's disease, about one in 10, as opposed to one in 1,000 in the general population, about one in 10 people with Parkinson's will have a family history, but not necessarily mum or dad. It could be a cousin, for example. And is it particularly, do you look for a stronger genetic influence in younger onset, as, it, as in cancer? Certainly. But I mean, I think what we, we, we talk about younger onset with Parkinson's in lots of different ways. When I think about genetic Parkinson's, I'm thinking under the age of 30. Oh, really? That young? That young. So by the time you're under the age of 30, your risk of genetic cause is probably 90%. By the time you're over 40, that really drops off dramatically. Jodine, what myths do you come across in relation to Parkinson's disease? Oh, well, that you will automatically become totally incapacitated, um, that you will have significant problems with dementia um, early on. I mean, I think they're uh, a great fear of, of totally losing functionality very early on. Meg? Another myth is that you'll end up in a nursing home. Yes. And that's not yes. the case. You can live well with Parkinson's. Really? And the myths between, you know, it, Parkinson's is not just a, a physical or movement um, disorder, but it also has the non-motor non, um, symptoms like the depression, sleep problems that we talked about a bit earlier. And what, what do you hear? On the, you're out talking to people, you know, the community all the time, Moira? Um, I suppose the biggest fear is um, admission to a nursing home. You know, and that is one of the myths. That that's what they see. Yeah. Are the hallucinations like you know in, in Lewy body dementia? Yep. The hallucinations are really quite consistent. That people see the same sort of hallucination. Is it the same as true in Parkinson's yes, disease? Yes, it is. And the, the pathology of Parkinson's, or at least advanced Parkinson's disease, is very similar to what you see in Lewy body pathology. In fact, under the microscope, they look pretty much the same. So the common, um, if you like, uh, spectrum of disease with hallucination of Parkinson's is from vivid dreams, so very well-formed dreams that are quite disturbing when you wake up, and then misperceptions when you're awake, you know, going into a dark room, mistaking a, a, a lamp for somebody standing in the shadows of the corner, and then benign hallucinations where you see something usually quite friendly, like an animal or a person, you know, often a deceased spouse, in fact. Um, and then finally, this pathological end of uh, paranoid psychosis, where you see somebody who might be very threatening to you, carrying a weapon, for example, and believing that people are intruders are in the house and infidelity against your partner, or they're, they're in it against you. Um, you know, it, these are very common. And El Dorpa doesn't touch that. Well, the problem is that uh, when you've developed uh, hallucinations in Parkinson's disease, dopaminergic therapy, be it dopamine agonist or levodopa, seem to aggravate the hallucinations. And we have this... Which is what Moira experienced. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. What we have is this terrible divide between um, being mad and mobile um, <laughs> and being able to, you know, your medications work and I can walk around, but I actually am a danger to other people <laughs> and myself, or slow and sane. Mm -hmm. And, of course, patients often want to be mobile and their loved ones often want them to be sane. Yeah. So we've got a question that's come in from uh, Sue Fitzgerald, the patient election liaison officer in Caboolture, who asks, who says, my poor mum finally succumbed to Parkinson's disease in 2009 um, with severe dementia. I want to know if my mum had this awful disease, will I get this also or my other siblings? Um, the answer is uh, I'd probably be more worried about having inherited her risk of high blood pressure or cardiovascular disease rather than thinking you were directly going to get Parkinson's disease. I think the answer is yes, you are at a slightly higher risk, 
but I think you must be really be very unlucky. The number of cases I see who have a direct uh, transmission between uh, parent to child is very low. A question from Marilyn Jones who asks, um, we know about cord blood collections and we've heard of fetal cell transplants and stem cell transplants trying for Parkinson's disease. Sh you know, could this be a method of treating Parkinson's? Should you, you know, collect cord blood as a, for Look, future Parkinson's? People are investigating stem cells at all levels and the truth is that we're not there yet. The studies that were done back in the early 2000s, 2002, 2003, I think, uh, using fetal uh, stem cells were actually discontinued early because, unfortunately, patients developed debilitating uh, side effects from the treatment. In fact, they developed involuntary movements so severe that they required deep brain surgery to correct them. There are people who are still working on stem cells. The problem that I see with this is that most people who are working on stem cell therapy are aiming to get stem cells that will produce dopamine. And that is only a very small part of the problem when it's we think like about hallucinations like and depression. It's like and the, yeah. Exactly. Not as simple as people thought. Not. And um, a question from Dennis Cato, which, who asks, what's the value of DNA testing, for example, provided by the Michael, Fox, Michael J. Fox Foundation, 23andMe? Um, well, I, I, the answer is uh, collecting DNA and doing genetic research is very valuable and certainly that obviously forms a part of my own work so I have a disclosure of interest. Um, but the fact of the matter is we do not routinely screen for genes that cause Parkinson's disease. There are some programs in each of the states you'll find who will take on patients who have a very strong family history or a young onset of disease and are very interested to meet those people. I'd, I'd, in, I'd encourage them to do that but that's not part of our public health system. Let's go to our first case study. Tom's 45. He comes to see Geraldine in a rural clinic complaining of tiredness and mild depression. He has a stiff left arm and a mild tremor which he puts down to an old sporting injury. He's a real estate agent. He's been relatively inactive. He's overweight with a BMI of 28 and he's got a wife and two teenage children. I'm going to go straight into our poll question for you. After you've taken this history with Tom, what would you do next? And you can take one or more of these answers. This is for our web audience but you can actually make a note of it yourself at home or at your site. Would you do a CT scan, full blood count, thyroid function test, an ESR? Would you just do a test therapy with L-DOPA? Would you refer to a neurologist? You've got 30 seconds to answer that question. Well, what are you going to do for it? We'll come back to the tests in a minute. What are you going to do? Well, I was thinking about this um, after having... Um read it and run through. I'd examine him, of course, a little bit more thoroughly. That's a bit radical, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> You're taking your history next. What are you doing? That's right. And, um, and plump out the history as much as, I, much as I can and make up my mind what other things I wanted to exclude and what um, valuable material I could get uh, from um, investigation. So I, I would make up my mind about doing um, some of those investigations. Which ones would you do? I probably would, given he's got the stiff arm um, and the mild tremor, I probably would do a CT scan to exclude uh, something going on in his head. A full blood count and an ESR is, is always a reasonable test to do. I mean, I guess it's a bit of a net if your ESR is really up. <laughs> you know, but this is more the wrong. differential diagnosis rather than trying to pin down Parkinson's. It is, it is. It's, it's trying to make sure that you're not missing something else. I think. Um, with the symptoms, the in, in, uh, examination is really important, particularly with the tremor, trying to sort of put in other neurological things that go with Parkinson's. Moira said something wonderful to me off camera. She said, the damn thing about this disease is we don't have a test. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, unlike the diabetics mm -hmm. you were saying, and you know, it's like, well, I can monitor my disease because mm -hmm. I know my blood sugar is high or low. Mm -hmm. This thing relies on mm -hmm. time sometimes. Time and trying to convince someone of what you've experienced. And also, too, because it can be so variant from day to day, it's also keeping track of all that yourself. Mm. Mm. Would you do a test of L-DOPA? No, I wouldn't. Um, I wouldn't feel comfortable doing that because drugs have side effects and I'd like to be fairly sure of uh, my, my potential diagnosis before I did a trial. I'd probably chat to a neurological colleague. Well, what, that just what happens, he's off the phone <laughs> and he's ready for a chat. He's off the golf course and he's here. <laughs> That's right. Um, look, I, I mean, I think the interesting thing about this case is he's 45, mm. which is not in the hitting zone for Parkinson's mm. as we normally see it. So, you know, we're Just thinking, before you go on, let's get the results of that, sure. that, that poll and see. So what would you do next? So a lot of you would do this, the, you know, the general workup, uh, thyroid function test. Not so many of you, so an ESR. And um, 
very few of you would launch on an L-DOPA and a lot of you would refer to a neurologist, but if you're in a country town, um, you know, that could be a six-month waiting list. That's right. That's right. Hence this conversation with you, yeah, Professor Lowe. Well, absolutely. And I think, I mean, my overarching uh, goal with Parkinson's is to treat each individual as an individual because the disease is so variable between cases. We know that younger onset seem to have a slower progression. And this is really a time where I'd be thinking, God, if this is Parkinson's, if I'm confident this is Parkinson's, does he really need treatment or should we be looking at other things? Because we've got one of the world experts in physiotherapy mm -hmm. sitting here. And we know that exercise programs early trying to restore balance and counselling, make sure that you know, everybody's addressing the, the bigger issues, the psychosocial so issues. You, so you'd do those, investig those investigations are okay? I would definitely do a CT head scan. Um, because, because of the focal signs. Absolutely, I wouldn't want to be caught out by that. And certainly, you know, when I saw him come to my clinic, then I would probably go for an MR because he's so young. Um, in the case of uh, someone like this, of course, Wilson should never be forgotten. Mm. Copper studies for Wilson's disease because, of course, you know, it's one of those reversible Coming on this lid. I I've seen Wilson's developing people in their 60s. So the answer is absolutely, you should always think about but it. But alongside that, I would also look at the walking pattern, because we know certain things about Parkinson's, that they have difficulty doing two things at the same time. Mm -hmm. So if you get a person to walk Isn't that just because of the Y chromosome? <laughs> <laughs> Could be that as well, but it's very classical of Parkinson's uh, patients. If they have to walk and turn, um, walk and talk, walk and carry on tray, it's when they have to string together long or complex movement sequences, things become slow and shrink down. So, so it's very recognisable. Would you start... So you're saying you wouldn't start treatment? I, I would never rush a patient onto treatment um, on the background that um, at the moment we don't have an agent that changes the course of the disease. There is some speculation about one medication which may get licensed here later, in, uh, later this year in Australia um, where there is some evidence suggesting it might slow the disease a little um, but there's nothing at the moment that we would be able to say yep this is going to change the course of your disease from a tablet. They're all symptomatic treatments. So tell me about this exercise intervention. Because so we've, we've actually got a question here from an exercise physiologist sure. uh, wanting to know, it's from Anna Dawson and Bendigo, Bendigo Health, wanting to know what the latest discoveries are for the best physical exercise interventions for Parkinson's disease. Yeah. Which so the... I think that physical activity as a whole is really good for people with Parkinson's, so the, the use it or lose it type of phenomenon. But two things, one is looking at strategies to uh, use the, the mind to control movement, to be very mindful of large movements and moving fast. So think of walking with long strides. Mm -hmm. Think of large handwriting movements. Think of talking loud. So, so it's forth. almost patterning. So it's bypassing the defective basal ganglia by using the frontal cortices of the brain to control movement. So goal directed yeah. would the, be the catch. And yeah. the other I'm going to achieve that, like I'm going to pipe yeah. this cake. Exactly, and, the, and that becomes a frustrating thing. You've got to think about everything you do. And you're conscious. It's got to be deliberate. Mm. Alongside that, we can try things like visual cues. So the basal ganglia provides an internal cue to trigger one movement to the next mm. in a sequence. With Parkinson's patients, if you put strips of cardboard down on the floor or use musical cues, they can move much more easily. So those sorts of tricks and strategies can be very helpful. And, what and also alongside that strength training, because people with Parkinson's tend to get a little bit deconditioned and less physically active. So there's great value in progressive resistance strength training. Really, what do we know about cognitive stimulation? Um, we do, well, there's, there is some research that has shown that the more cognitive active they are, that they, um, I mean, I'm probably not the best expert to answer this question, but um, that it, it does improve their memory. And I think it's good. You're, you're also good. done research yeah. in so the So cognitive, cognitive stimulation is good, mm. but interestingly what often people do is they fall into the trap of doing the things they like. Mm. So if they're a Sudoku champion, they'll do lots and lots of Sudoku, when in actual fact what they probably need to do is something else that's going to stimulate them more or be more challenging, such as taking on a second language or learning an instrument or something that is, you know... Something that causes a bit of pain. Bad medicine, you know, good medicine tastes the worst. It's as simple as that. The other thing also with this patient is we're all talking about, um, you know, some of the physical symptoms, but like this gentleman is overweight, he's inactive, so I would be referring him to a dietitian as Go well. Sister. Physiotherapist, yeah. Physiotherapy. definitely. I would be looking at the needs of his wife and his two young children. Mm. I would be getting him in contact with the support groups. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on with this, you know, what about work? Is he still yes. working? Is there any mm. idea of, you know... What about driving? Driving as well would be a big issue. So does he, can he drive? Does he understand? With Driving is a huge issue in rural areas because people are, do rely on their driving 
um, for independence. So you know you have to explain to the to to Tom that you know his reaction time is he able to react quickly if someone's coming towards him. So would he be safe? Would his teenage girls be safe? Would that other car be safe if he's driving? You know night you know night vision as well. Sometimes night I know I don't have Parkinson's, but sometimes the night the glare of other lights can affect my driving as well or being able to see things. But there's a whole heap of issues with this gentleman, not just these physical symptoms that um, mm. you well, know, we've been talking a, about. A big part of his life, isn't yes. it? Because yes. he's a real estate agent exactly. in a Correct. rural area. Yes. yes. When did you stop driving? I stopped about, oh, I'm still driving, but I drive um, with, only when my husband's with me. That's on long distance, where I'd be driving over 100 k's. I can drive around town quite well, that's good. But if I do have some wearing off, uh, I'm not good at driving then, so I wouldn't drive. Um, and I have you ever had an off time when you've been driving? It's oh, come yes, on when you've yes, yes, yes. <coughs> and um, Ray, my husband, he he will even notice it happening. He's become aware, and he'll go, "Aha!" You know, and I just pull over. So that's why I'd never take off on my own. Um, on long distance driving. But I think driving. when driving too you can plan the driving route out in advance yeah. so you're not I, thinking about where you're going as yeah. you're driving. Actually that is really something, yes. It's knowing where you're going is a big thing. So mm. to be suddenly flung into an unknown area to drive, that, that would really send you. And multitasking as well. Oh. I mean I tell my clients not to have conversations mm. with each yes. other while driving, not to have the radio yes. full blast because multitasking mm. can be difficult and it's not just a man thing. Mm. <laughs> Jodine, when would you refer to a neurologist? Well, I think the thing about Parkinson's disease, particularly as we said with its subtle onset, it's really good to get a diagnosis early. Um, and because there's but you've no kind test, of made it already. Yes, but because there's no test, you, you're you not always 100% sure. It's nice to have confirmation. So, what about comment. telehealth getting um, Professor Lewis on Skype? Um, well, I'm interested. He'd get in paid for that. I'm interested, and yes, GPs would get paid for that as well. Um, so you into telehealth? Um, Look, it's Simon? interesting. When we wrote the proposal um, for Marilia's position as Australia's first neurological nurse educator, the government uh, told us that there was no way. I put into it e-health because I thought this would be sexy and I thought it would, you know, appeal to the right people. And uh, they said, you know, you can't bill for that. And now, two years later, it's their idea. Um, and I think the the question is whether it's going to be, I think it'll be by and large very helpful, but in actual fact what you really need on the other end of that line is somebody who understands the disease. Mm. And unfortunately, um, if you look at all the studies, and I know Geraldine's published on this and I've published on this, GPs lack confidence in managing Parkinson's disease. And that's not a surprise because A, they don't see much. They don't see much. And B, what they see looks completely different. They'll have one 84-year-old in a nursing home and one 42-year-old who's still at work. It's, a, it's an impossible um, thing for them to get their head around. It's not fair. So in actual fact, having people who have experience and see the whole spectrum, and most Parkinson's nurses will have two to 300 cases. Well, the truth of the matter is that they'll have seen most of the things by then. And being guided by that sort of person on the end of an e-health consultation is actually much more valuable, no offense, but then having a GP saying, hey, could you mind having a look at this guy walk for me on the, um, on the screen? Don't forget, if you want to uh, ask a question, you can phone in. Your number, the number is one 800 The fax number is one, uh, sorry, I think you've given the wrong number. The phone number is one 800 and the fax number is one 800 You can email us at questions at rhef.com.au um, and you can send in via the webcast by clicking, right, it's typing in your question in the live talk section and clicking submit and we've got a few questions to come in a moment. Um, the, um, and I've got a question for you, another question for you, which, in your view, which of the following factors are most important in deciding to use medication? The age of the patient, impact of symptoms on the patient's quality of life, the patient being anxious to commence treatment, postural hypotension, the state of the patient's cognition. And again, you've got 30 seconds. Uh, to answer that question. Let's uh, go to our next uh, um, case study, who's Amanda. She's 55, a teacher, diagnosed with Parkinson's disease in the last year. Um, at a le recent review with you, Geraldine, she complained of stiffness, fatigue, shoulder pain, and some slowness of walking. She's considering giving up her part-time teaching job. She's not on any medication. And you've got a six-month waiting list to see Simon. 
Well, I guess you're wondering, um, does she need medication and how can I affect a consultation? Um, how can I get further advice? Um, and what can I be doing to um, maximise things for this patient now? So um, this is where I really want to be sure that I've set up my neurological consultation as soon as possible, um, that I've set up another team around this person. Um, so that might involve the physiotherapist or the occupational therapist um, or the speech pathologist um, in terms of helping her keep moving along. You've got all uh, those management. in Wagga, have you? Yes, we have all those in Wagga. There'd be some of the smaller surrounding towns that might not. Um, but um, in my area, we've got the two major and regional areas that, that um, people can refer to. Um, some of those services are pretty stretched, however, um, but we could set up those services. This is where care planning comes in. So is she getting what Tom was getting, which is intensive exercise interventions, nutrition, general health and well-being, and yeah. so on? Yeah, I think we need to make sure all of those things are in place while we're asking ourselves, does she need medication and how can I get an opinion about this? I think physical activity can be really important there. Things like golf can be fantastic, yoga, tai chi, dancing, yeah. treadmills, bicycles, all of those things can be really good. Mm. So Marilla, if you saw Amanda and she wasn't on medication and this, let's say she's having all the interventions, when would you be sending her back to either the GP or the neurologist for...? Well, considering that she's thinking of um, uh, retiring from work, so that's a quality of life change. So I would be um, asking her to see, get a baseline from her neurologist. Um, uh, whether medication would be something because neurologists in rural areas can take six to eight months for initial consult but once you've been in there it's easier to follow up so I would be um, looking at that you know is she um, leaving work because she, her symptoms so in other words, are not treatment could keep her yeah, at, at work. work yeah definitely so quite that, a few people will travel to the city mm. to get um, yeah absolutely a, a diagnosis uh, so let's, as well. let's just go to the poll question before we see what you thought about the most important factors in deciding to use medication um, the age the impact and the quality of life. Let's have a look at the graphic. So not many of you thought age was important. Most of you thought the impact of the symptoms yeah. and quality of life. You weren't too concerned about the patient's anxiety. Uh, you correctly said postural hypertension is not a reason, although cognition did score a little bit more highly. Comments on those answers? Uh, look, I think it's great that the majority have said Quality of life. I think that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, I think it's really um, interesting that people are also paying heed to cognitive function because they're recognising that this is more than just whether someone's forgetful. They actually realise that the impact of cognitive function has on day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. And actually, in fact, they go hand in glove together. But the treatment's not going to do much for that. Look, the treatment, uh, it's interesting because we do know from some of the neuropsych testing and the research we've done that some cognitive um, function is improved by dopaminergic therapy. So in actual fact, we do see people, you know, increase their processing speed. And when we think about working memory and planning, so executive functions, that seems to be improved by dopaminergic therapy. So, so what's on offer here for...? Look, I think um, we could fill several days talking about this, but there are no hard and fast guidelines. Australia doesn't have one uh, for how, what this patient should definitely have. The options are there and um, we, I think, hopefully have some reference later to an online program and resource that GPs will be able to sign in and have a look and educate themselves on this. But levodopa, most of my specialist colleagues would probably leave um, as a first line until later. So try and Why avoid it. Because we know that the longer you're on levodopa therapy and the higher the doses, the sooner you run into problems with motor fluctuations. And we heard a little bit earlier about this cycle of the tablets wearing off and patients feeling as though they're trapped in concrete and it's their own body. Um, and then they get a peak after they've taken their tablets and get a lot of involuntary movements, which actually they tend to prefer to have that state than being trapped in your own body because it's like being buried alive. The problem with that state of affairs is that you're then into serious advanced therapies of Parkinson's. So we try and defer levodopa exposure as much as we can. So you go with the hypersexuality? Well, it's interesting because, as I mentioned briefly, there, there looks like there'll be a, a third choice, a sort of almost political third choice, uh, which will be available, I suspect, before the end of this year, which will be a medication that comes from a different category. Um, it, it's very similar to selegiline, so the monoamine oxidase inhibitor. Which used to be first-line therapy for which Parkinson's. Which it was, it was vogue for a while. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, this other medication called rasagiline um, has been licensed in most parts of the world now for 
since 2005. So I think that will give us some extra options as to what to start patients on. It doesn't seem to carry the impulse control disorder as its risk, um, but every patient is individual and we you know, have to tailor the treatments as such. And what's the story with timing and dosage and so on? Well, the good thing about both of those uh, medications, the dopamine agonist and rosangeline, the monoamine oxidase inhibitor, is that they're very simple in that it's once a day. The monoamine oxidase inhibitor, rosangeline, is one milligram once a day. There isn't another dose for it. Uh, the dopamine agonist that's most commonly used now in Australia would be a drug called Pramipexol, and that does come in incremental doses, and of course the logic would always be start on the lowest dose you can get away with and titrate slowly. You've got a strong issue with timing, haven't you, Moira? I do, yes. Um, it's just so important to have your medication on time every time, and I, I just really encourage nursing staff in um, acute hospitals or nursing homes to please give their patients their medication on time. This is particularly relevant for the levodopa preparations. Their mm. half-life is only two to three hours. Mm. And actually, you know, this is why it's fundamentally important because those patients who have more advanced disease definitely benefit. How often would you review Amanda? Let's say you put it, you know, she goes on primapexol or something like that. And um, how often would you see her back? Would you leave that to Amanda or would you have a regular review process? Um, well, for any of my patients with chronic illness, I try to review them fairly regularly and that might be one, two or three monthly depending upon what their condition is and how they're sailing with that condition. So let's follow up uh, Amanda five years on. So she's been put on uh, dopamine treatment. She's developed problems with getting a good response from her tablets throughout the day. She spends about a quarter of the day with involuntary movements and a quarter of the day where her tablets don't seem to work at all. So where to from here? Marilia, if you saw her with this story, what yep. would be your advice to her? So um, a few things. I would look, I would go into deeper. So I'd look, I'd look at any protein and, you know, um, levodopa interaction. So mm -hmm. is she having her medication with, the, with meals or not? And try that. Uh, if it was so it's important to have L-dopa with meals? No, mm -hmm. um, not with meals. Not so with now meals. before and now after because there is a protein right. interaction with levodopa. What other drug interactions are there with L-dopa? Oh, oh. it's, it's generally well tolerated. I mm -hmm. mean, um, you know, most patients, of course, who get Parkinson's disease have a range of other conditions. Diabetes, cardiovascular disease, depression is part of the syndrome. So most drugs um, are okay with levodopa. There are very few that you would say, actually, no, you just can't have that. In fact, I can't think of anything off the top of my head that you'd say, no can't have that. Any but physiotherapy yeah, interventions? When they're, they're in the off phase, um, physiotherapy strategies like the cueing and the attentional strategies, think big and so forth, can be really useful. So I think that's really yeah. important to teach to people that when they're off, yeah. there's strategies to unblock their fr feet when they're freezing mm -hmm. and so forth. Which was a strategy for your cooking. Piping, piping, room. That's exactly mm. right. Mm. Mm. I mean, I think the, the problem with this scenario, it, it's, it's all too common. After five years, at least half of patients have developed these motor fluctuations going between switched off and involuntary dyskinesia. And really, you, you often tinker with tablets and tinker with these other things, but you, you have to make a decision about more advanced therapies, such as subcutaneous apomorphine, usually delivered in a pump. So that's a needle under the skin that goes in the morning and comes out at night. There's now a treatment called Duodopa, a tube that goes like a peg tube, but is a pedge into the small bowel, and that infuses a liquid, um, a gel preparation of levodopa. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, uh, the one that gets all of the attention is deep brain stimulation, so mm -hmm. an operation. But it's very worthwhile recognizing that deep brain stimulation, all of these therapies do pretty much the same thing. They improve the amount of good on time that patients have to about the same percentage, by and large, to be frank. Mm -hmm. the, the risks with them are obviously different in that to have holes drilled in your head is very different to having a needle under the skin. And so that, that takes a little bit more thinking around whether you're going to go ahead. And also some patients just aren't suitable for deep brain stimulation. For example, if you're over the age of 70, I don't think anyone would operate on that patient. If you've developed significant cognitive impairment or hallucinations, again, very few people will be put up for deep brain stimulation. And is there tachyphylaxis? Does it wear off? The deep brain stimulation, and the, 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 it's interesting because, of course, patients always blame the tablets or the treatment and never identify the fact that's actually going wrong is the brain. So the brain keeps changing. 
So in actual fact, we need to keep escalating tablets or escalate the, 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 the intervention. The voltage and the frequency. Absolutely, the, the frequency. So, I mean, the fact of the matter is that we always blame the tablet. And, of course, it's, <laughs> it's us. Yeah, you uh, also have to look at, if the pa you know, as a nurse in the community, you always have to also look at, is that client or patient having their medication too close together or too far apart? Mm. Um, and if they're not... If their symptoms are not being controlled, then yes, it would be time to get in contact with their GP or neurologist and have their medications reviewed. And nope. you need to look at them in different settings, look at them at home, yep. look at them at work, look at them in the community. I sometimes video record the off time, take their medication, how long it takes, and I send that video to the neurologist, um, if that helps. Um, definitely, definitely. I mean, would, it, that, it, it, would that help with telehealth, you know, having, I, having that sort of thing? Because I'm... I'm aware of the can con think through the contextual difficulties, but I still think there must be some role in terms of moving things along for the patient in terms of chatting about what am I going to do with the medication. I, I, think, it's, I think it's accessing a specialist session. with yeah. somebody who knows that, you know, this is the question I need to ask of that yeah. specialist. To be yes. frank, most specialists who heard from somebody with much experience as Marilia would say, okay, well, it sounds like we need to do X, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. You know, you can show me the video if you like, but frankly, I hear what you're saying. Mm -hmm. The patient isn't lying to you. You know, you know them well, and they're telling you these difficulties. Mm -hmm. And of course, the interesting thing is that they take the video the next day, completely different symptoms. Mm -hmm. And I just found with the telehealth as well, um, you have to make sure the neuro you're there for a couple of hours, yes. and you have to make sure the neurologist is available for a couple yes. of hours. You've got to follow them around with this laptop, mm -hmm. which you don't see the big picture. So I personally find that video in them, I can film and I can do, and then I can let the neurologist know that way. Yeah. And identifying what patients call specific symptoms. I've got clients who call um, off time freezing. So, you know, if they go to the neurologist and say, I'm getting a lot of freezing, the neurologist is going to think it's freezing of gait, but it's actually off time. So identifying those, those terminology that they use in letting their GP or neurologist know that's what they mean. Let's go to a couple of questions because we've got consumers uh, watching us, particularly uh, on the webcast. And this question come, has come in. My husband has been on medication for Parkinson's for nearly 14 years. He's now on a combination of medication, Madopar. What's Madopar? That's a levodopa. That's levodopa, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I've been out of the system. Paramax, Comtan and Inderal. Um, what's Comtan? Comtan is entacapone, so it's a Compt right. inhibitor that gives you uh, more delivery of levodopa to the brain. And beta blocker? Inderal is a beta blocker, so some patients, he may be on it for blood pressure or heart disease, but it may be that some patients are using it for tremor, so some right. specialists will use it for tremor. And Permax will be um, a dopamine agonist. So this is um, a patient who's on most of the, the common therapies that we have. So while on this cocktail of medication, my husband has more downs than ups during the day, and this comes to your terminology as what is a down. Um, and it's obvious that some further decisions um, to be made. What would be the next step on treatment for my husband? Uh, well, every case is different, but if you're looking so at... So we should just have a disclaimer here that we're not yes. giving you a serious <laughs> disclaimer. Is that we're yeah. really not giving you Generally. advice about your husband. We're using this as an indication, as an example to as to what you might do in a situation like this. You really are going to have to talk to your own doctor about this. But can I, I think this is a very, very uh, typical scenario. And what we've not heard there is about whether there are visual hallucinations and depression and everything else mm. that's feeding in. And my suspicion is that this patient who's had the disease for as long as that is probably a candidate for what we might call that more continuous dopaminergic stimulation, whether it be apomorphine, duodopa, or DBS depending on their state, as I've mentioned before. But the, the other thing is we need to assess the whole family. It's not just yeah. the person with yeah. Parkinson's. So we need to think about the caregiver, and whether there's caregiver strain, and you know, other family members and how it's impacting upon that system. And another question from a consumer is, uh, what, should, what can I do about my husband's fr frequency of urination? Oh, Marilia, <laughs> please help um, us. Well, when I see clients... Well, this could uh, be prostate, couldn't it? It can be, yes. but it, it, usually it's it's related to their Parkinson's. So I look into, you know, how much caffeine are they having throughout the day? Are they drinking alcohol? Do they drink before bedtime? I teach them to do pelvic floor exercises, especially men, because they have no idea what it is. And if, if I can't manage that like that, then I would refer them to the continence nurse, who's the expert, to see if there's anything else that... Um, can be done. I mean, it's interesting because, of course, the other thing you need, you can never look at the bladder in isolation. You have yeah. to look at the bowel because constipation yeah. will go hand exactly. in glove with yeah. this. And then, of course, the other thing which any good geriatrician and all the GPs are clued into is what tablets is this patient on? Because if they're on a diuretic, you start looking and going, 
Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we might have to change the game here. Mm. Yeah, just have it Also right. to keep in mind that most people with Parkinson's are older and might have two or three co yeah. chronic oh, conditions, absolutely. so there could yeah. be other absolutely. Yeah. And you have to look well. at all that, yeah. Did you want to comment on that, Moira? Nope. <laughs> 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 Do you want to give some medical advice to our viewer? Uh, no. Well, well um, what Simon was saying is really looking at the bladder and the bowel together, yeah. really, um, because that will, um, the constipation, and um, I will say constipation is a big thing yep. um, with the Parkinson's. And you can easily fluctuate from, oh, isn't this gorgeous talking about the bowels? <laughs> We've got the hypersexuality to bowels. Oh, my right. God. And you're a nurse. That's we talk great. about bowels all yeah, the time. Yeah. Just <laughs> go with it. They've had, their, they've had their supper. Yes. They've had their supper. Um, yeah, you can go from a normal bowel action to a constipated bowel action. Quite quickly. Yeah, one yeah. one day can be different to the next, as quickly as that. So you really just need to make sure you eat your fruit yep. and um, keep up a good high fibre diet. And exercise. Diet. There's and a whole exercise. Exercise, exercise. 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 is a huge factors, thing. Yeah. Mm. Let's go to Mrs <laughs> Banks, who's 69 years old. She's had Parkinson's for nearly 20 years. She retired at 54 because of her condition. She's got bradykinesia, an intermittent left arm resting tremor, balance problems. She falls a lot. She's got all four limbs being fairly rigid at times, especially the lower limbs. She's depressed. She has visual hallucinations and postural hypotension. And a couple of months ago, she moved into a high care residential facility because it just became too much for her husband. She, um, since she's gone into the facility, she's had increased hallucinations and pretty paranoid behavior. And she's pretty inactive and depressed. Geraldine, you've been called to the nursing home. Um, is this typical for someone with Parkinson's disease? Mm. Well, I think um, this lady's clearly progressed in her Parkinson's disease with multiple problems. So uh, similar to the first one, uh, I would think medication, what, what, what is she on, what's contributing to it, what's, what's she uh, needing that, that, that she's not on, what uh, other advice do I need to get from, from somebody and what other helpers do I need in this situation to help her for, such as with her exercise, her fall, her balance retraining. Um, hallucination, hallucinations um, um, are a significant problem that I would need further advice as to what I so can So we've got a question down, here from one manage. viewer asking about antipsychotics. Yes. Great. <laughs> Excellent. This is great. So, so presumably <laughs> Risperidone, the... Look, 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 look. To this, quieten her down a bit. Mm, just an absolutely fantastic question. And the answer is um, all of the things that we've just heard from Geraldine about looking at this patient as an individual and saying, look, we need probably to simplify their drug regime because the fact of the matter is their balance has gone, they're in a nursing home, the chances are that we're not going to get them independently mobile. So then you have to look at their prescriptions and say, well, what's actually helping and what's actually harming? We've heard about dopamine agonists causing more in the way of hallucinations and behavioural disturbance. And really, at this stage in the disease, I'm often looking, well, what can we do without? How can we simplify this regimen? So you could often make her better by stripping out some of the Absolutely drugs. Absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. And then what is it that might have tipped the balance? Is there a new medication? Is there a metabolic disturbance? You know, lots of uh, patients with constipation just go hyponatremic and go confused, and they fill up our emergency department every day. Then on top of that, you know, is there a septic disturbance? UTIs come into emergency response so it's, all the it's time. So standard. Absolutely. It's geriatrics 101. 101. And it's interesting because a lot of people, I was talking to somebody um, who earns their living in Canberra, they didn't know that our emergency departments get full up of people who just go confused because they're constipated. Yeah. And it's one of those things which you'd hope a nurse could intervene and stop from happening. I mean, politicians do it all the time. Indeed, <laughs> indeed. Now, in terms of what choice for that pervasive psychosis, this is where we get into really interesting territory, again, political, and I love it. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> At the moment, Australia on the PBS, you cannot prescribe legally an antipsychotic medication for Parkinson's disease. You can prescribe it. But they're throwing it around for Alzheimer's too, for with devastating consequences. Absolutely. And if you want to prescribe it for schizophreniform symptoms of Parkinson's disease, yeah. funnily enough, that seems to be okay. And this is a nonsense. Now, in terms but is it like Alzheimer's where you can actually do quite a lot of harm? Look, the answer to that question is we don't have the long-term data on Parkinson's disease. What we do know, however, is that patients who become psychotic are a danger to themselves and others. And it seems to be that one of the it is, I'm sorry, the leading precipitant for people going to a nursing home. Not only because they're a danger to themselves, but the caregiver just cannot handle it anymore. Now, interestingly, the only antipsychotic that's been shown in a randomized controlled trial to work for Parkinson's disease psychosis is clozapine. 
Now, close opinion, you either have to be related to the Pope or, or have a letter written by the Pope in the blood of a virgin and <laughs> to be able to prescribe it, or be a psychiatrist. Well, certainly a virgin that's not on Primapexol, anyway. Absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, the, the fact of the matter is you, it's very hard, unless you're a psychiatrist who's got all the monitoring to use clozapine. So that's the only drug that we have licensed. We, uh, sorry, that would actually shown to work. The other antipsychotics are effective. I tend to use uh, olanzapine because, in actual fact, if you miss a dose, it seems to be okay, and you can use a wafer. Uh, and that can often be easy to administer. Quetiapine, and the, the message with these drugs is, of course, start low and see how much you need. We must avoid the risperidones of this world because we know that they do provoke increased Parkinsonism. Mm. And so we need to get that message mm. across that actually I think you should treat the psychosis if it's pervasive, and I think you have to choose an atypical antipsychotic that you feel comfortable with and start low and then titrate the dose. The other thing is, though, you know, it's a change of environment for this lady yes, as well. Yes, so yes. there's been a change from home to mm. a new a home. home. Uh, so it's trying to educate the health professionals in that nursing home as mm. well to try and you know, help this lady adapt to her new home. So you know, in nursing homes, if, from my experience, if someone is a falls risk, they automatically don't allow them to become very active because they don't have the resources. So it's a matter of educating these nurses about the, the importance of activity, socialisation, all that. That may also reduce the hallucinations. You know, she's depressed, she's left her husband, or, you know, her husband's not there with her all the time now, and etc. So there's been a big change for this lady as well. What's her prognosis? Mm. Uh, poor is the answer to that question in one word. I mean, I think uh, the, the, the fact of the matter is that we know that admission to a nursing home with Parkinson's disease is 10 times greater than the age match population. And we know that by the time you're like this lady, uh, in the advanced stages of the disease, sort of four and five where you're not independently mobile would be the easiest phrase to describe it, that that rate of admission in a nursing home is much greater. And, and her life expectancy? Well, the fact is that um, we know on average the life expectancy for Parkinson's disease is 12 years. Tell that to a 42-year-old who's been diagnosed and you're clearly off the ballpark. This lady, she's 69, she's had the disease for 19 years already, and in actual fact she's now in a nursing home. And the chances of her survival for the next five years are pretty slim, and one would guesstimate two years and because of course if she triggers a fall and breaks yeah. a hip yeah. you're in a nursing home with a broken hip and the long-term survival on that when I was in medical school was pretty poor it was 50 percent at two years if I'm 60 percent right. of patients have falls every year so, with Parkinson's well I'm hoping as a nurse that I'll be able well a nurses um, will be able to change that by providing education to mm. nursing home staff mm. in the importance mm. of physical activity and, all. and I am already seeing that in the Shoalhaven with some nursing homes so and they're getting improvements Impro you know improvement so, so, an awkward question, Maura, but I'm, I'm going to ask it anyway. Have you written out an advanced care directive? Or, no. I mean, there, there isn't such a thing in Victoria, but it's, you know, yeah. there, it's got another name. No, I no, I haven't. Um, I've got a good rapport with my husband and my children. And I think when the time comes yeah. um, that I'll be able to clearly give them indications. I don't see at this point in time in my life that I need a, an advanced care directive. So um, it doesn't bother you that without something written down, the doctors really can do anything they like? Uh, uh, no, I don't think so. I've, I've appointed um, a power of attorneys, medical. Um, no, I don't think so. I think my family will step in for me. I have every, every okay. trust in them. I encourage my clients, um, while they're still sane of mind, mm. if there's already any cognitive um, symptoms, I will encourage them to think about it and look into it, at least guardianship and power of attorney and all that, so that they have a choice mm. in, in their care. Mm. Now, mm. What, what they would like to happen to yeah. them should they end up yeah. in hospital yeah. with an emergency. And sometimes it brings up a lot of issues, a mm. um, lot of, you know, death and dying issues. Um, mm. And that's where counsellors come in as well. Mm. Mm. And um, I intend to still be around till I'm 90. Of course. <laughs> mm. One of the issues of the nursing home is, uh, rem I'm reminded by one of the um, nurse carers in one of the focus groups we ran uh, for her husband where she really felt powerless and that was around the timing of the medication mm -hmm. for her husband yep. but also being moved yep. and you know with this lady having hallucinations stuck mm -hmm. in a new place freezing up all mm -hmm. the time not having somebody coming regularly to move yeah, her. I get, move her I get calls all the time where clients um, are 
confused um, because they don't understand that their night screams are maybe vivid dreams or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. And so they, they say that they're confused and they get the mental health team in, uh, etc. And it's just a matter of educating. I, I show them videos of real patients um, and that seems to put everything to perspective with these health professionals. Uh, and, and I do, I have seen changes in some of the nursing homes that I've been involved in, in doing a lot of education sessions. It's, mm. it's, it's a work in progress. Mm. It's mm. all about a team approach to care, isn't yeah. it? Mm. Mm. Nurses, physios, yeah. doctors, and listen, OTs. And listen to carers as well. Mm. Carers are an amazing um, group of people um, who we need to listen more to because sometimes they, they feel left out. Well, right? the, key, the key point about carers and they don't often see themselves as carers, they're informal carers, yeah. but we use their services all the time, is that I can give you a very long list, you know, hallucinations, falls, dementia, of things that put people into a nursing home. There's generally one yeah. that keeps you out, and you married them. Mm. So That's you have right. to choose very wisely. So and it's interesting because, you know, <laughs> what we see from the data coming out from the Shoalhaven project, which Marilia has spearheaded for us, is that actually her intervention is improving the health of the caregiver. And, it, you know, it's good for the patients too. But in actual mm. fact, when you're looking at, you know, and our tidal wave of ageing population, how do we keep people out? Well, the first thing we should think about is supporting the people who are already doing Very the job yeah. on the ground. Yeah. Is, is that your feeling? Loss of spontaneity of yeah. life. Absolutely. You know, that just goes. Yeah. Yeah. And once a year, go on a dopamine agonist and then have a holiday. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's just the doctors. Simon, what are some good sources of information and training for people who are interested in taking this further? Look, um, in terms of, uh, we've got two really. I think Parkinson's Australia are our overarching NGO. Um, the states and territories have their own individual um, associations, but Parkinson's Australia will help guide people towards resources that you can rely on. So the state and territories have their own um, NGOs. In partnership with the Commonwealth Government, uh, gosh, three or four years ago now, uh, Parkinson's Australia set about producing an online education resource, it, it, it resource for GPs. Um, and so that's now uh, just been hosted by uh, uh, the Australian um, Rural and Remote. Uh, College of Rural and Remote Medicine, yeah. Mm -hmm. Acrum. Acrum. And, uh, and that, I think, is going to go live sometime in the next week, and I think people should get on there and register. The great thing about the course that you can do, A, it's certified for points, but you can dip in and dip out and often what GPs need to know is, well, how do I deal with the next crisis? I don't necessarily need to hold, know the whole thing. And speaking as a specialist and also with my other hat on as being on the board of Parkinson's New South Wales, I don't care how you're using it, as long as you're using it and you're finding it beneficial, please. There's, there are some, just sorry, there's some also some really good ones for nurses and al allied health professionals. Mm. For example, you know, Parkinson's um, Victoria and Parkinson's mm. Western Australia have guidelines for mm. nursing management and physio management mm. uh, and Parkinson's New South Wales, but also the UK Parkinson's Association. Mm. So what's your messages, take home messages for people watching? Uh, mine would be carer based and I think, you know, um, just to let carers know to stay passionate, um, stay positive, um, patient, be very patient and be proactive. Meg? Physical activity and exercise are good, good for the body and good for the brain. Yeah. Simon? Um, it's not good enough to just look at a patient and go, is everything all right? The fact is that we've heard there are so many different aspects of this disease. There must be something that as a healthcare professional we can improve upon and I'd ask the the people who are watching this program to get involved with things like constipation, sounds silly, depression, all of those things that, you know, in a consultation when you've got 10 minutes, you don't want to get involved with. Moira? Yes, please, nurses, medication on time for all you people with PD every time. And the second one is that um, um, presently um, Parkinson's Australia is lobbying the government for funding for um, clinical nurse specialists in Parkinson's. And please, please, we need it. They are the angels. As Simon says, they're the angels, they're not the gods. Jodie? One of the things the project that we did showed me was how alone many people with Parkinson's are in New South Wales and um, how they wanted to have more of a relationship with their GP around getting things organised for them. So it's about being proactive as GPs, get the care plans together, think about what the issues are, what are the goals and what am I going to do about it. So I hope you've enjoyed this program. Thank you all very much indeed. I hope you've enjoyed this program, Parkinson's disease, find it useful and informative. I 
brushed up on our brand names at least. If you're interested in obtaining more information about the issues raised, there are a number of resources available on the Rural Health Education website, rhef.com.au. And you can also go to the, and there you can go to the Parkinson's disease program page and click on resources. If you're a health worker, don't forget to complete and send your evaluation forms, which can be found on that web page. You'll receive a certificate of attendance and, if eligible, CPD points. Our thanks to the Department of Health and Ageing for making the programme possible. And thanks also to you for taking the time to attend and contribute. I'm Norman Swan. See you next time.